Hello again. Now, if you want to build a bigger construction, we're going to have to take a few clues from the engineers of the past. These were obsessed with building even bigger and bigger bridges and buildings until they built enormous suspension bridges and, and skyscrapers. And the composers of the uh, 18th and 19th centuries seem to have been obsessed with doing just that, just making something bigger and bigger. And, but of course, they were sensible enough to know that it had to hold together. Anybody can write a piece of music that lasts two hours, but not very many people can write a piece of music that's two hours and is still interesting. Now, let's start with the tiny forms first. What are we using? We're using tonality, the sense of coming back to where we started, and we're using repeat of material that we've already heard. So let's look at a few children's songs. Well, that was obviously a repeat. And then we have... Which is a repeat of the first line exactly. So we have A, B, A. Now, this is a very similar tune, Baba ba, Black Sheep. Okay, so that's closed itself in, it's come back to its original starting point. Now it starts higher. Again, very similar to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. A different twist here, so this you could say is sort of A, B structure. So, here's a German children's song, very popular in this country. That's the first phrase, but ending on the dominant. More or less the same phrase, but ending now in the tonic. This is different. But this is a repeat of what I've just heard one tone higher. And that's an exact repeat of the second phrase. So there I can say I have A, A, B, A. These basic children's structures keep cropping up. Beethoven wasn't ashamed to do the same thing. anthem or the Ode to Joy or whatever you like to call it is actually a sort of a reworking of Hensian Klein. Now Baroque dances tend all to have the same structure. You'll have a first part which may or may not modulate to the dominant and then will be repeated. Then the second part will again be repeated and will of course come back to the tonic. Uh, very popular, long after the uh, Baroque time, was the minuet and trio, so-called. And the minuet, quite simply, is a 3-4 dance, observing this structure, often just with a very short first part and a slightly more extended second part. But both halves would be repeated, and then you would get what's called a trio, which is just a second minuet. It's called a trio because the first were all usually based, the first minuets were usually based on four-part harmony and the trio on three-part harmony. And uh, the trio has the same structure as the minuet, usually in the same key, often in a related key. And then, of course, there's a sense of homecoming when we come back to our basic key for the repeat of the minuet. The rondo also relies on this idea of recurring. So you have an A, and I, a simple theme, often quite a playful theme. And then you'll have a B, section, and then you'll have A again, then you'll have C, 
usually in different keys. The B might be in the dominant, C might be in the relative major or relative minor, depending on your basic key. And then you'll have a rather reprise of the A at the end. Or this can actually go on indefinitely, and the older rondos often have A, B, A, C, A, D, A, F, and so on. Yeah? But it's always based on this recurring idea, this coming back to a theme that we can recognize and to a key that we recognize. Restative and aria is a structure very popular in the opera, particularly it has got established in the Baroque time. The recitative would somehow tell, set the, give us the setting. We could say, you know, being a little bit naughty, we could say the soprano was about to tell us why she's terribly sad. So she lists all the things why she's awfully sad. There'll be some little chords maybe from the orchestra just in between, or maybe just from the harpsichord. And then she gets into the business of the aria, and then she really expresses just how sad she is and leaves us in no doubt on the subject. This will usually have a very characteristic structural element, which is called a ritornello. This will be used at the introduction before she starts to sing, and then she'll usually take this, uh, this melody from the ritornello as the beginning of what she's going to sing. It may go off in completely different directions. But interspersed, while she's taking a breath, there will be... Uh, a little bit of memory of this ritornello, which will usually return again at the very end. Now, something else that started in the Baroque time was the solo concerto and the concerto grosso. The concerto grosso is based on the same idea. There's a ritornello always coming in between passages which the three solo instruments will decorate. And they can, because there are three of them, they can actually work quite well just on their own. And then... Uh, also interspersed then with the, with the whole orchestra, which comes in then with its ritornello, exactly the same principle as the aria. Solo concerto is based on the same idea, but um, the Baroque concerto developed then into the, the classical concerto, which uses the same sort of structure as a sonata form, which I'm going to talk about later, but you'll probably know the basic elements. And if we say that in the concerto first movement, we have a and B of the sonata form, and then those are in, both in the same key and are taken just from, the, uh, just from the orchestra. Then the soloist comes in, and we get A and B again, probably slightly more developed, yeah? and uh, this time the B section will be in the dominant, as we would expect, or relative, whatever. Then we have a, de um, a, a development section. And then, well, the sort of recapitulation, this may be a ritornello, we're not quite sure what's going to be here. But uh, then we'll get a cadenza and a coda. But I'll talk about these other structures, uh, structural elements, when I come to talk about sonata form. Quite the most important building structural uh, designs that were used in the 18th and 19th century were the fugue and the symphony. Uh, the, they're both based on the idea of the, the tension between tonic and dominant, so they're very much dependent on tonality. They're based on the idea of uh, themes that we can recognize when they recur, and they're based on the idea of returning to a certain key with a sense of homecoming. Now the fugue, as you may know, an exposition, that's the opening of the fugue, must introduce all the voices. If it's going to be in three parts, well, there's like three instruments playing together, even if all three parts are played on the piano. Four-part fugue, obviously, corresponding. Fugues seldom come in more than six parts because then it just becomes a tremendous mess and we don't know where on earth we're going. But even a six-part fugue is very, very rare. Bach apparently could improvise these things. I haven't a clue how he did this. But if we just go to the normal structures that we have, an exposition should state the theme, which, if you're lucky, will have two parts, so that these could be split up later for development. It should have, but certainly, be recognisable, so that when it recurs, everybody will say, oh, there's our old friend John again, All right? Now, the first thing you're going to get is this in its tonic, and then, if it's a well-behaved fugue, you'll get an answer, which is the same theme again, in or on the dominant. Now, what's the difference between an in and on? Well, look, if I do this, that is it. Just, just to say that's my, my, my fugal theme. And then the answer would have to do... 
Well, that would then be a real answer. That is in the dominant because it does literally exactly the same. But if my answer does this, then it's sort of compromised and it hasn't really modulated at all. So it hasn't gone up a fifth at the beginning, it went up a fourth and went back then to its tonic note. And this is what we call a tonal answer. Okay, so then we get a, a, a third entry, which will again be the in the home key. In the meantime, the other voices are doing something else. This may be important structurally, isn't necessarily the case. And once the last voice, no matter how many voices you have, once this last voice has entered and stated the whole theme, that's the end of the exposition. Then we alternate between developments and episodes. So that it's a bit like a rondo in this sense. What you'll get is an episode, which means this is thematically nothing to do with what we've just had. So, and then you'll get um, a, a development, which is one of the voices at least must state the theme in its entirety. Then we get maybe another episode and another development. And then, well, who knows how many of these episodes and developments we may not get. But finally, we will end with a finale. And the finale is characteristic in that it's rather similar to the exposition. It tends to be more complete with all the voices stating the theme altogether. There may be one of them may go down and hold a pedal of some sort before we finally get our perfect cadence to end. And there are other techniques that can come up, usually coming up in the finale. Stretto is very popular, where the themes, instead of waiting politely for one another to finish what they've just said, tend to interrupt one another, and it all becomes almost like an argument. It can be very exciting. Or we can take the theme very slowly and spaciously, which gives a sort of rather triumphant ending to our fugue. And of course, there's any other sort of alteration that we might like to bring into this. This basic structure, as I say, it's very, very good for a sort of intellectual development. It sounds like an intelligent conversation between the, between the different voices. Although, of course, in a real conversation, people don't just repeat what the other person just said. Now, the first of Bach's 48 Praise and Fugues, the first fugue, starts off breaking the rules because it looks as though it's going to be a fugue in F major because of this typical relationship between the tonic and the dominant. But he cheats us and says, oh no, it was C major all the time. This is the second voice answering a real answer. Okay, now we shouldn't have done this. This is actually another answer. He shouldn't be doing this at all. He should be doing his subject again. All right? Instead, uh, we get another, uh, uh, we get a development, and not only a development, but a development based on stretto. So, so. so we've now come to our dominant. us with this, he's now taking us with his main theme in the dominant. So he next makes a next development on the dominant key, but he's going to modulate from there as well rather quickly. minor now. And then he says, oh, what the hell, I may as well go back to the beginning. With a straight over. And so he'll carry on, just breaking the rules quite happily as he goes. 
thank heavens for people who can break the, the rules with so much humour. Bach actually has a tremendous amount of humour. If you know the rules of fugue, you'll enjoy his fugue so much more for the very fact that he's always breaking these rules. It's a very subtle sense of humour by comparison with Beethoven's, who was more of a sort of banana skin type of comedian. Now you remember some time ago we talked about variation form. I think it was in the eighth talk. And you don't have to, of course, uh, use this structure in order to write variations. And the idea of the variation is what we need to be able to pick up. The idea that you can take a theme, toss it around so that only certain elements are, are kept. There's still something in it we can recognize, but it's somehow been treated to all sorts of variation. This type of variation is what happens in developments in fugue. And there's a very important section of the next thing we're going to discuss, which is the sonata first movement, sonata form, or symphony first movement, has lots of names, but this structure was then really quite basic to practically all music after about 1750, until about 1920, it just keeps cropping up absolutely everywhere. And it's based on the idea that you have uh, a theme or a group of themes in the home key to start with, then you modulate to the dominant and have a group of themes in the dominant and, uh, and uh, then you may have a codetta, something to end this, but it's all still in the dominant. Then we have our double bar line and we go right back to the beginning, repeat all of that. So we have A, B, C possibly, A, B, C up till now. Then comes the big development section. It could be even a little tiny development section and it can even sometimes even be left out. But this development section then should work with material from that exposition and somehow present it in a new light, maybe modulating, maybe uh, turning the themes upside down, doing a bit of counterpoint. Later symphonic composers often like to do little fugue sections in this as well. And so we can use all sorts of elements we like, but the most important thing in the whole movement is this moment when we suddenly find ourselves back where we were at the beginning. This wonderful feeling of homecoming. There are hundreds of different ways of doing this, and it's so fascinating to see how the composers have done this differently. But there's always this, the one sensation is, ah, we're back in the same key, we have our A and our B once again, but now everything is repeated just in the tonic. And then, very important, the earlier composers, the first composers who did this, always went back to that double bar, that same double bar, and repeated the whole development and the recapitulation, all of that once again. Now, with modern performances, this second recapitulation, the second um, uh, repeat, is very often left out, which is a tremendous shame because it, it tends to take away from the structure of the whole piece but I can't tell you how unpopular you'll be as a conductor if you try and tell your orchestra you want to do all the repeats of this movement. Now this is a piece of Johann Christian Bach, whom Mozart admired very much. It was probably written about not long before Mozart was visiting him in London, and uh, so he may have got to know it there. <laughs> two themes already. Here's a repeat of the first. Well, that's just a repeat of the second. Now we're going to have something new. because it's new again, but we've now modulated in a fairly primitive way. All we did was just quite happily in D major, we introduced a D sharp to introduce us to E major, which became uh, a sort of dominant then for A to be the second subject, as we call it. Of course, we've, had, we've got two themes already. This is the first...
something new here as well. Well, this is something, again, thematically quite new and quite interesting, something that we can remember, so it's worth calling this a little codette. exposition a b a b now the development section based on material from the exposition okay well that's obviously taken from b2 okay this is based on the a3 as we called it in the exposition Reprise, but we're still not in the right key. We're in the relative minor, so we have some homecoming to do. We're in G major, the sequence takes us to A major. But we're in the right key. Yeah, quite a dramatically exciting moment. And then he goes on to behave himself fairly well. He has to make a little compromise to make sure he doesn't modulate this time into the, uh, into the uh, dominant, because he has to stay now in this key until the end of the piece. But he repeats this... <laughs> key for the recapitulation of the B part. symphony is really capable of doing is just to listen to the nine symphonies of Beethoven. I can really recommend this. It can be done in a day and then you really do have a very good impression of what the whole thing is about. The ninth symphony alone is just a huge cathedral built in sound and uh, there's not much more then really to be said about the whole form after that. That's all for today. <laughs>